Well, friends, it's a great joy for Margaret and myself to be back again. Uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, it was 2017 I was last with you. That was the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and I spoke at two midweek meetings covering those events and so on. So uh, it really is lovely to be back. Uh, Tim mentioned about newsletters. I issue a, a sort of newsletter update every six months, and the last one was in December. That's what it looks like. They're in very short supply by now. So I think there's half a dozen copies somewhere down there. So if you want to get one, and if they're all gone, and he made me a good offer, then you could have this one that I have up here. So uh, those, are, those are there. Um, it was the 10th of January that Tim sent me an email asking me if I would be interested in coming along and speaking on the subject, should a born again Christian be a member of a secret society? And I think he probably had in mind groups like Freemasons, the Orange, the Purple, and the Black, and a few other societies as well. Uh, they regard themselves as being true brotherhoods, but my view is that there is only one true brotherhood, hence the title of the talk for tonight, and that's what I, I want to share with you. Uh, in Psalm 133, the psalmist wrote this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And that's the one true brotherhood, those who are united in Christ and worshiping the only true God, the God of the Scriptures. Uh, and Paul went on to write in Ephesians chapter 4, Keep the unity of the Spirit. There is one body and one Spirit, one Lord and one faith. Now, I will say at the outset, you know, Tim and I wouldn't dot every I and cross every T similarly. But in spite of slight differences, we are united on the core issues. We are united in Christ and what the gospel is. It's a long time since I've actually spoken on this particular topic. So if you see me fairly glued to my notes, uh, you will understand why, because I want to make sure that it comes across as it's intended to. So where do I begin? Well, I was converted back in 1984. Uh, at that time, I was working for the uh, Lester Billing Society in Portadown, and that was August of 1984, and I was living in that area. And a short time afterwards, I got a job in Belfast with the Progressive Building Society. So I thought uh, it would be a good idea to move. And I ended up in 1985 coming to live in Carrie Duff, which was very convenient, obviously, uh, to Belfast. Uh, you may have seen it in the news recently. There was a cannabis factory discovered on the Balna Hinch Road in a big house that was just across the road from where I used to live. So it wasn't there then. Anyhow, I moved to Carrie Duff in 1985, and living straight across the road from me was a retired vet, a Christian man called Jim McCormick. And for many years, Jim had operated a ministry from his own home, warning people about non-Christian faiths, about religious cults, and about groups like Freemasonry. And I got friendly with him, and he would be out speaking at meetings, and he would have a bookstall. So I would go along with him, and I would sort of man the bookstall. And one of the books that he was famous for was Christ the Christian and Freemasonry. And I just want to read a couple of things from what he wrote at the beginning of his book. Jim said this, This book has been written because I believe God has called me to do so. Freemasonry, far from declining, has been spreading. Most alarming, perhaps, is its penetration deep and wide into the established Reformed churches. Political maneuvering and compromise, tolerance of evil, and the overthrow of justice can, in many cases, be traced back to masonry or the spirit of masonry. The only answer to the problem posed by Freemasonry in church and state is to be found in God and his word, and in the gospel of Christ. He then said a little bit about the different degrees, if you like, in masonry. He said, craft masonry consists of three degrees, entered apprentice, fellow craft, 
and master mason all working in lodges. Royal Arts Masonry is composed of companions who meet in chapters. It constitutes the seventh degree of masonry and can only be reached through craft, masonry and the lodges. Scottish masonry has 33 degrees. The Mystic Shrine is an oriental degree of masonry, purely Mohammedan in origin and totally anti-Christian. So those were some interesting facts on the background of my getting an interest in Freemasonry. Uh, when I was growing up with my two older brothers, we were both in the boys' brigade. And so I was particularly interested in 1988, about three and a half years after I'd been converted, to learn that there was going to be a special Freemason Lodge set up to cater for former members of the Boys' Brigade. It was BB Lodge number 619. Now, why did they choose the number 619? Well, the motto of the Boys' Brigade is sure and steadfast. And that is taken from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, 619. This is what that verse says. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Uh, Pastor John MacArthur commenting on that verse, he says, Our hope is embodied in Christ himself in the heavenly holy of holies on our behalf, keeping the believer secure during times of trouble and turmoil. And as a modern-day hymn writer wrote, uh, I thought it was going to be it that we were going to be singing there, in Christ alone my hope is found. That is totally at odds with what masonry teaches. Uh, in a book, one of several that I have with me here, they quote a very high-ranking uh, mason, a man called Manly Hall, and uh, he wrote a book called The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. And keep in mind that our hope is in Christ alone, but this is what he wrote. The true Mason is not creed-bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. Well, if you're a Christian here tonight, you will realize just how wrong that statement absolutely is. However, uh, going back to the formation of the, the BB uh, company, our lodge, uh, back in 1988, uh, it was held in the church halls of Ballyclare Presbyterian Church Hall. And I want to read a few excerpts uh, from the proceedings that happened that particular night. First of all, they had a dedication prayer, and this is some of it. Almighty God, great architect of the universe, who has laid the foundations of the earth and reared the heavens on high, mercifully look upon thy servants now assembled before thee and grant that our labors begun in thy name may be continued under thy direction and ended to thy glory. May the great light of thy sacred law ever present in our lodges illumine our mind with its steadfast rays to the end that peace and contentment may dwell in our hearts. May we here meet in, the presence, in thy presence as a band of brethren who were brought into being by the same almighty parent and are duly sustained by the same bountiful power and are traveling the same road to the gate of death. And finally, when the time of our earthly labor is drawing to an end and the pillar of our strength is lowered to the ground, enable us, supported by thy rod and staff, to pass through the valley of the shadow of death to those mansions eternal in the heavens where peace and love and harmony, such as the world cannot give, forever reign before thy throne. Amen. Now, that's very subtle because there's phraseology in there that you and I would recognize as biblical. There's no doubt about that. But the reality is that it's a very, what I would call, generic prayer. 
There is no mention of the triune God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit revealed to us in the Scripture, and there's absolutely no mention of Christ's work at Calvary. As the uh, Constitution uh, continues, uh, we read here, the procession makes a circuit of the lodge during which the following ode is sung. So whatever room they were in, they ground it and they sing, Genius of masonry, descend, and with thee bring thy spotless train. Do at our sacred rites attend, whilst we adore thy peaceful reign. So they're singing to the genius of masonry and referring to their sacred rites. It goes on, and they are now on their fourth circuit around the room. <laughs> my... my Wicked sense of humor. I was picturing Joshua going around uh, Jericho, you know, uh, blowing trumpets. But anyhow, a fourth circuit, this is what they sing. To heaven's high architect, all praise, all praise, all gratitude be given, who deigned the human soul to raise by mystic secrets sprung from heaven. So you can see that this is all uh, very much divorced from the truth of the scriptures. Then they come to the benediction. May the Most High God, the giver of very good and perfect gift, bless the brethren here assembled in all their lawful undertakings and grant to each one of them a needful supply, the corn of nourishment, the wine of refreshment, and the oil of joy and peace. There's no mention of praying or meeting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we then go on to, at the end, where they say, what is a mason? A mason is a man and a brother whose trust is in God. Generic again. From his initiation as an entered apprentice, he travels ever east toward the light of wisdom until he receives the final, the divine password that admits him into the ineffable presence of the eternal supreme grand master of the universe, God. Again, they're talking of God in generic terms. It could apply to any God. Uh, they talk about initiation. But friends, Christian initiation is the new birth Amen. when you are converted. At conversion, we receive Christ, who is the light of the world, and we are adopted as sons of God. We don't need a divine password to enter into glory. Yeah, they were probably didn't realize they were going to be ahead of their time talking about passwords. Uh, if you're like me, every time somebody asks you for a password, you have to really think and so on. But anyhow, the reality is that if you're a Christian, we are accepted in the beloved. We don't need any password whatsoever. So that happened in 1988, just about three and a half years after I was converted. And that really triggered an interest in me about what Freemasonry was all about. Uh, and then in 1992, my interest was again intensified uh, by two things that happened that year. Uh, first of all, in June of 1992, uh, it marked the 275th anniversary of the founding of masonry in the United Kingdom. Uh, the great Grand Lodge of England it met, first of all, in a tavern uh, in London. And uh, there was coverage uh, on television of that, a great event. Uh, the Duke of Kent is the overall grand master, and it showed you the masons coming in on the black and white square and uh, going up to the front. And I remember he, he sort of jokingly said, well, it's good to have the TV cameras here, you know. Uh, maybe once every 275 years, it's good to let a few people come in and see what we were actually about and so on. Because normally, uh, no non-Masons would be able to see what was happening. And then, uh, of course, uh, in 2017, it was the 300, the tercentenary of the founding of the uh, Lodge in London. And again, the Duke of Kent made a video uh, speaking about what a wonderful organization Freemasonry was. So that was one thing that caught my interest in 1992. But then there was another thing that happened as well. 
the Presbyterian Church in Ireland had had a committee looking into the whole subject of Freemasonry. Uh, it was their doctrine committee. And uh, a resolution was proposed and passed uh, at their general assembly of that year. And it certainly caught the attention of many. Uh, I have a local newspaper report by uh, a man called Billy Kennedy. Uh, and this is what the resolution said. The General Assembly, in the light of the Doctrine Committee's report on the beliefs and practices of Freemasonry, disapprove of communicant members of the church being involved in Freemasonry. So that, that was a good stand that the Presbyterian Church took in 1992. A few other things in this report by Billy Kennedy. Uh, he said the Masonic, Masonic Order in Ireland is understood to have a membership of about 50,000. The successful General Assembly motion was proposed by the Reverend Norman Macaulay. Uh, Norman Macaulay and I uh, both went to Methody and we, we played hockey and cricket. Sometimes I played hockey with him. I certainly played cricket against him and he was quite a mean fast bowler, I can remember that. And uh, he's been ministering down in Greenmill Street Presbyterian in Newton Ards for a number of years. He must be coming up to retirement. And then it also quoted uh, another minister called the Reverend Robert Nixon. This is what the report says. The Reverend Robert Nixon spoke as the son of a Freemason in Belfast, but as one who realized at a very early age that there was something in Freemasonry that was not for the glory of Christ. Mr. Nixon said that having examined the 300 pages of the laws and constitution of the Masonic Grand Lodge of Ireland, he found that nowhere was the name of Jesus Christ mentioned. So uh, in the wake of that uh, Presbyterian Church uh, resolution, there was quite a flurry of media activity. Uh, on the 4th of June, uh, I was interviewed over the phone by David Dunseith, uh, who at that time was the presenter of Talkback. If any of you ever remember David Dunseith, he was a bit of a Rottweiler, uh, if I could put it that way. But he interviewed me uh, about the topic and then the following day, he interviewed a man called John Hamill, who was the secretary of the Grand Lodge in England. And what was intriguing was that uh, as Dunseith was interviewing Mr. Hamill, uh, Hamill uh, he, he sort of paraphrased the resolution along these lines. He, he said that it means that you cannot be a Mason and a Christian. Well, I, I don't actually uh, agree with David Dunseith's interpretation of the resolution or of the thought behind it and so on, because I think there is ample evidence that there have been and are Christians who were Masons. And I know that from very personal experience, which I will mention later on. So the question is not, are Masons Christians? The question should really be, should Christians be Masons? Uh, and in fact, uh, David Dunseith asked me, are Christians Masons? And I said, David, that's a wrong question. The question should be, should Christians be Masons? So to help us sort of answer that, I want to uh, just read a few small uh, portions of Scripture. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, we are in the Sermon on the Mount, and I want to read from verse 33 down to verse 37. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. This is the Lord speaking. He says, Again you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil, or cometh out of an evil heart. And then James chapter 5, just one verse, verse 12, uh, it's very similar. Uh, James writes, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, lest you fall into 
condemnation or judgment. Uh, some people have said, well, you know, in the light of that, what happens if a Christian is called to be a witness in court and you have to go up and take the Bible in your right hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Personally, I don't have a problem with that because really what you're doing is you're promising that your yea will be yea and your nay will be nay. And I think in those cases, uh, it's not a problem. But the message of Scripture is clear. Yet degree by degree, Masons swear oath after oath to be secretive, selective, and partial. Here's some lines from the oath of the first degree and entered apprentice. I do hereby and most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear that I will always heal, ever conceal, and never reveal any of the secret arts, parts, or points of the hidden mysteries of ancient Freemasonry, which have been heretofore, may at this time, or shall at any future period, be communicated to me, to any person, except it be a true and lawful brother Mason, or within a regularly constituted lodge of Masons. I furthermore promise and swear that I will not write, print, paint, stamp, stain, cut, carve, make, nor engrave them, whereby the same may become legible or intelligible to any person under the canopy of heaven, and the secrets of Freemasonry be thereby unlawfully obtained through my unworthiness. To all of this I most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear, under no less a penalty than that of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out by its roots and buried in the rough sands of the sea at low water mark, where the tide ebbs and flows twice in 24 hours. So help me, God. So in the first degree, this apprentice is swearing not only to keep secret what has so far been revealed to him, but also to keep secret what will be revealed to him. Also, here a mason is giving permission for his body to be severely punished, and in fact for him to be killed. So what is the Christian's responsibility towards his body? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Christians are to glorify God in their body. They're not to give permission for it to be severely mutilated, in fact, put to death, if they let slip a Masonic secret. It's an obvious breaking of God's commandment for a Christian to swear these oaths. But the sin is compounded by the permission given in these terrible oaths because our body has been purchased by the precious blood of Christ. And for any Christian to make such an oath I, I, it's just unbelievable that they could even think of doing that. If a, a mason, a Christian mason, takes these oaths seriously, he has, in effect, violated the sixth commandment. He's giving permission in advance to his own murder. Exodus 20, verse 13 says, Thou shalt not kill, or literally, thou shalt do no murder. So the Christian Mason is really guilty of being an accessory before the fact. That's what that amounts to. Then perhaps a Christian Mason might say, well, this oath, I'm only giving lip service to us. It's really only a sham. And I, I don't really mean what it says. Well, if that's the case, then he has just violated the third commandment. Exodus 20, verse 7, forbids the taking of the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Because in that oath, the mason has invoked the name of his God. So help me God, was the closing part of the oath. And he may well have kissed the holy book, 
that he reveres and respects, and it'll be on the altar in the Masonic Lodge, and that for him would be the Bible. And so, as I say, he is breaking the third commandment. He's taking God's name in vain. He's also guilty of violating the second commandment, which forbids idolatry. Because as he swears these oaths, resting on the altar will not only be a Bible, but will also be the square and compass. And these are often idolatrous symbols of pagan worship. They symbolize the heavens and the earth and the procreating principles. Uh, there's a book or a report I have called the Masonic Report, and uh, the forward to it was written by a man called James D. Shaw, who had been a 33rd degree Mason, and then he got saved. And this is just a little portion. He says, I was thoroughly ignorant of Masonry's true purpose and aim, like the majority of those who bow before its idolatrous altars. So, as I say, swearing of these oaths is wrong, and in doing so, Masons are violating at least three of God's commandments. Moving on, I want to uh, <coughs> turn to Matthew chapter 23, and in particular, we'll be looking at verse 10. But before I get to verse 10, I also want to read verse 9. Matthew 23 and verse 9, the Lord says this, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Now, as Protestant Christians, if you like, we great, lay great emphasis upon that verse. You know, we think it's totally wrong for our Roman Catholic neighbors to refer to their priest as father. And so Protestants take, you know, they, that very carefully and they will say, you shouldn't do that. But then what does it go on to say in verse 10 of Matthew 23? Neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. And of course, in the Masonic order, the head of the lodge is the master of the lodge. And not only is he the master of the lords, he is the worshipful master one worthy of worship. Matthew 6, verse 24, the Lord said, no man can serve two masters. Luke 4, verse 8, when the Lord was being tempted, he told Satan, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Human beings are not to receive any form of worship. In the house of Cornelius, Peter refused to accept worship. Acts chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 22, an angel refused the worship of John. Every Grand Lodge has a most worshipful Grand Master, and in England, that's the Duke of Kent. And the use of these titles is without doubt a violation of God's word. Then I want to turn to 1 Peter 2 and uh, chapter, uh, verse 17. 1 Peter 2, verse 17. Uh, and there we read this. This is Peter's command to believers. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Well, who is this brotherhood that Peter is telling people that we have to honor? Well, if you go back to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, beginning at verse 22, Peter writes, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. <coughs> The one true brotherhood, title for tonight's talk, is made up of those who have been born again of incorruptible seed by the word of God. Is it uh, restricted to those who meet 
within the confines of a Masonic temple? Well, again, I want to go back to Matthew chapter 12 and to begin to read at verse 46. Matthew 12, 46. While he, that's Jesus, yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. The Freemasonry Brotherhood, it is a rival restricted brotherhood. And by its very existence, it is in conflict with the plans and purposes of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've seen quite clearly that the swearing of oaths uh, can and do violate a number of God's commandments, the second, the third, and the sixth. But in reality, the very founding principle of Freemasonry violates the first commandment. The founding principle of Freemasonry is a belief in God. And Exodus 23, 20 verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The God of the individual Mason is a God of personal choice. Let me repeat what Manley P. Hall wrote. The true Mason is not creed bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. So these people, they have supposedly received divine illumination from the Lodge, and as a result of that, they are universalists. Well, of course, in Matthew chapter 7, the Lord made it plain that the broad way leads to destruction, and it's the narrow way that leads to life. And in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And Peter in Acts 4, 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. This broad road view, if you like, it was expressed in a letter uh, written by a man called Michael Walker. He was then the secretary of the Grand Lodge of Ireland. It was published in the Belfast Telegraph of June 1992. And the uh, letter registered Masonic disappointment at the resolution that had been passed by the Presbyterian Church. And this is what he said in the letter. Freemasons believe that any activity which tends to corrupt a man's relationship with his God should be ceased immediately. If membership of the Masonic Order or of a similar society or of a company or of any organization is in all conscience perceived by that person to be damaging his relationship with his God, then he should make the decision to take the appropriate action to preserve his relationship with God. So twice in that statement, he refers to uh, the person and his God, not the only true God. <coughs> this uh, error was again clearly shown in another letter in the Belfast Telegraph of the 27th of July, 1992. You probably guessed by now that a lot of material I'm sharing with you could be viewed as a bit dated. Well, it may be dated, but it's still absolutely relevant to the situation here and now today. And this letter was by a man called Robert Simpson, and he was responding to the Reverend Robert Nixon, who I had quoted earlier. 
and this is what Mr. Simpson wrote. Of course, we have to accept that Freemasonry is not exclusively Protestant, or even Christian for that matter. It is more a universal brotherhood, which comprises those of other creeds and colors. In the course of almost 48 years in Masonry, I have sat in lodges at different times and in different places with Roman Catholics, Greek, Orthodox, Jews, Muslims, and of course, those of my own persuasion. In doing so, I do not think that it detracted in any way from our faithfulness to our respective beliefs. So it's a universal brotherhood. It's not the one true brotherhood that I believe in. But again, what this man is affirming is a violation of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I assume by his persuasion, he probably claimed to be a Protestant. Well, I don't know if he ever read 2 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 14, which says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Uh, some masons over the years have said to me, well, masonry is Christian for two reasons. First of all, it respects Jesus Christ. And secondly, it uses the Bible in its meetings. Well, concerning Jesus Christ, a man called Albert Pike, who was kind of the Pope of Freemasonry, he wrote a book called Morals and Dogma. And this is what he said. Masonry reverences all the great reformers, it sees in Moses the lawgiver of the Jews, in Confucius and Zoroaster, in Jesus of Nazareth, and in the Arabian iconoclast, great teachers of morality and eminent reformers, if no more, and allows every brother of the order to assign to each such higher and even divine characteristics as his creed and truth require. Truth require. So, so Jesus is looked upon as a reformer or a teacher of morality. Uh, the presence of a Bible in a meeting does not guarantee that something is truly Christian. Over the years, I've spoken on many cults. The Mormons, they would have a place for the Bible. The Jehovah's Witnesses would have a place for the Bible. Christian science would have a place for the Bible. But I can assure you that none of those are Christians. The truth is that the presence of the Bible on an altar in a Masonic meeting, it is purely symbolic. Another leading uh, Freemason called Albert Mackay in a lexicon of Freemasonry, he said this about the Bible. The Bible is used among Masons as the symbol of the will of God, however it may be expressed. And therefore, Whatever to any people expresses that will may be used as a substitute for the Bible in a Masonic lodge. Thus, in a lodge consisting entirely of Jews, the Old Testament alone may be placed on the altar, and Turkish Masons may make use of the Quran. Whether it be the Gospels to the Christian, the Pentateuch to the Israelite, the Quran to the Muslim, or the Vedas to the Brahmins, it everywhere masonically conveys the same idea, that of the symbolism of the divine will revealed to man. So it is only a piece of furniture in a meeting, in a masonic meeting. The only way we can know the true will of God, Hebrews 1, first two verses summed it up very well. God in previous times spoke through the prophets, but now in these last days has spoken to us through his own son. 
These scriptures reveal the true will of God, and the incarnate Christ revealed the true will of God. Going back to Albert Pike and his book, Morals and Dogma, he said this, the Bible is an indispensable part of the furniture of a Christian lodge, only because it is the sacred book of the Christian religion. The Hebrew Pentateuch in a Hebrew lodge and the Quran in a Mohammedan one belong on the altar. So again, Pike confirms it's only part of the furniture. If a Mason believes that the presence of a Bible makes Masonry Christian, this idea is rejected by Masonry itself. Uh, another Masonic writer called Oliver Day Street, he wrote in Symbolism of the Three Degrees, no lodge with us should be opened without it, that's the Bible's presence. Still, it is but a symbol. It represents divine truth in every form. But the shadow must not be mistaken for the substance. There is nothing sacred or holy in the mere book. It is only ordinary paper. It is what typifies, it is what it typifies that renders it sacred to us. Any other book having the same signification would do just as well. In fact, that book should be used, which to the individual in question most fully represents divine truth. We dare assert that neither the Constitution, regulations, nor ritual of any Grand Lodge in the world requires a belief in the teachings of the Bible. We must frankly acknowledge the Bible to be a symbol only. Those Christian Masons who would enforce belief in the teaching of the Bible have simply mistaken the symbol for the thing itself. So that's their view of the Bible. Uh, I said that I was with you in 2017 talking about the Reformation and the five great solas of the Reformation and one of them was sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. That's where we get all the divine truth that we need. Let me ask a question. Is it an unfortunate accident that many Masons are deceived into thinking that Masonry is Christian? Well, the short answer to that is no. Uh, the last quote I read was from a book called Symbolism of the Three Degrees. Uh, and certainly in Ireland, most Masons don't go beyond the first three degrees. That's the entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master Mason. And these three degrees are referred to as the blue degrees. And Albert Pike wrote this. The blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to initiate, to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine that he understands them. The Jesuits couldn't have put it any better than that, to be quite truthful. So masonry in its early degrees sets out to deliberately deceive its members, and so many of them are fully convinced that it is Christian, but the truth is that they have been deceived. A candidate for the first degree, that's entered apprentice, he declares that he is seeking light. Then if he moves on to the second degree, that's the fellow craft degree, he declares that he's seeking further light. And if he goes on to the third degree of Master Mason, he declares that he is seeking more light. Does Christianity agree with this idea that as you become a Christian, you're seeking light for your soul? Well, Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. You can't go to any holy book on a particular Masonic altar and expect to get light from it. And if you go to the Bible, well, it's only there as part of the furniture. Proverbs 29, 13 says, The poor and the deceitful man meet together. The Lord lightens both their eyes. 1 John 1, verse 5 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. When it says God is light, that means that intellectually he is total truth and morally he is perfect purity. 
Is this God who is and who gives light some unspecified, generic, grand or great architect of the universe, a, a God of man's own choosing? No, he's the God of the Bible. Isaiah 45, verse 5, we read this. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Will he share his glory with other gods? No. Isaiah 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, and that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Masonry is a direct opponent of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, Paul tells us that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In Psalm 81, uh, verses 8, 9, and 10, uh, we read this. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. And a believer could say that the Lord our God is the one who brought us out of the Egypt of our sin and redeemed us. Should a Christian be a Freemason? Well, let me share some extracts from a few uh, testimony tracts that I have had uh, in my resources. A man called Marshall Almerod, under a heading of the danger of Freemasonry, he said this, I believe that masonry has many nice people who believe that they are going to heaven because they have learned the keys of Freemasonry and haven't done anything major wrong. They have good morals, high virtues, and believe in family values. They have been taught by masonry that they will go to the same place as their Christian brothers. Masonry misleads well-meaning people into the mistaken belief that anyone can make it to heaven without Jesus Christ. So that was the testimony of one former Mason. And then another former Mason, a man called Mick Oxley, he wrote this. I stand today with good men who have come out of Freemasonry. Others like myself became Christians and then found out that Freemasonry is in no way compatible with the teachings of Jesus Christ. I was not a Christian when I became a Mason. I took evil oaths that I recognize as part of the Hindu temple worship, words of evil that translated almost word for word from the Hindu language into English, and I spoke a bit of both having lived for time in India and studying the Hindu faith. As I went up into the higher degrees, I found more of the same evil curses and oaths. Remember that I had no claim to being a Christian at this time. I think the Royal Arch degree really made me see the evil of Freemasonry. Royal Arch Masons stand gathered together around what is called the Ark of the Covenant and call upon the God of Masonry, Yabulon. In masonry, Yah stands for Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. Bull or Bel is the ancient Canaanite God of fertility associated with licentious rites. On or Lun is the God of ancient Egypt, the God of the underworld of death. For a Christian to stand at this altar with others and cry out this unholy name in ritual of worship is spiritual insanity. A late mason of the highest rank in America said, no man or body of man can make me accept as a sacred word, as a symbol of the infinite Godhead, a mongrel word composed of an accursed and beastly God whose name for more than 2,000 years has been the name of Satan. Here then is the identity of the great architect of the universe himself revealed. 
And finally, uh, there's a little booklet by a man called Arthur Grooms, who was a Mason for 27 years. Uh, when I was about 15 years old, I was saved at a revival meeting in a little church in Kentucky and baptized in the creek. I later left Kentucky. I married and lived a while in Indianapolis, later moving to a small town with my wife, son, and daughter. We were members of a large church. I, being a lodge member and active in the lodge, spent a lot of time away from my family. Because I was a member of a church, I thought I was okay, but really was getting farther and farther away from Jesus Christ by letting things of the world rob God of my time and my money. I was impressed with the Mason's ritual, and after five years, I became master of my lodge. Masons have taken the Bible and made different meanings out of the word. Members think they do not need the church, nor do anything except work for the Grand Lodge above, and thereby gain admission through their good works. There is no Grand Lodge above. I swore in the Holy Bible that I would not reveal any of the secrets of masonry by punishment of death. After I finished my year as master, I never went back to the lodge. I decided to rest and be with my family more. I began to realize I had been neglecting them. I had robbed God of my tithes and offerings and had not served him since I was 15 years old. I got rid of the jewelry and the white apron. This break was like a heavy load lifted off my shoulders. I finally had surrendered all to the Lord." So there you have the testimony of men who had been Masons, but when they became Christians, they realized they could not continue with that. Now, although so far I've spoken mostly on Freemasonry, there are some points which I have raised which are in conflict with the Word of God, and they could apply to other fraternal societies, like the Orange Order, the Royal Arch Purple Order, the Royal Black Institution. And for women, you would have a choice of the Eastern Star or the Order of Women Freemasons or the Honorable Fraternity of Ancient Freemasons. I started off by referring to Jim McCormick and his book on Freemasonry, but he has a, a portion, a small portion at the back relating to Orangism. And I, I mean, I want to make it plain, I do draw a distinct difference between Freemasonry and Orangism. Uh, Freemasonry is a dark, anti-Christian brotherhood despite proclaiming light. Orangism is to me an unnecessary, unwarranted brotherhood despite defending liberty. I don't think the God of heaven needs men parading on the 12th of July with orange collarettes and swords and symbols and so on to defend the truth of the gospel. The difference in Orangism is that they only claim allegiance to the God of the Bible, whereas if we're seen for Freemasonry, anything goes. But these were uh, points that Jim McCormick raised in relation to Orangism. First of all, orange men promise to support and maintain the laws and constitution of these realms, which is, in fact, a promise to support and maintain laws, some of which are evil and unscriptural. No Christian should be asked to take, and none should make such a promise. Secondly, the Orange Order and the Royal Arch Purple Chapters and the Royal Black Preceptories are sacred societies. I tend to think of them more as societies of secrets because most people have heard of these, you know, so they're not really secrets if you know them, so they really are societies of secrets. The following proofs are offered. The lodge is tiled when in session. That means they check that it's only eligible masons who are in the room. If you're not a mason, you'll be put out. Passwords, grips, and tokens of recognition are used. The ritual approved by the Orange Institution proves that the lodge is sacred. Extrajudicial oath-taking is forbidden by our Lord and reiterated by James. Well, we've seen the scriptures that refer to that. To know that the master of the lodge is called the worshipful master and that his decisions are binding and cannot ordinarily be challenged brings us immediately into collision with the explicit teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ who said, call no man master. 
Orangeism frequently, if not always, involves the unequal yoke. Unitarian ministers are chaplains, and that's true. And Unitarians are not Christian by any stretch of the imagination. Many men who honestly acknowledge that they are not religious are members, yet the Christian in the lodge must pull together with his orange brother. Uh, I, I have witnessed that. I mean, as a boy growing up, uh, my father was in both the Orange and in the Masons, and I'll mention that later. But on the 12th of July, uh, we would have gone over to the Lisburn Road. We had relations who were members of Ulsterville Presbyterian Church, which is kind of across the road from Methody. And they have steps leading up to the church, and they used to put a lot of, put a lot of seats out on the 12th of July. So we used to go there, and we would get a seat, and we had a grandstand view of the Orange Men as they were walking past. And I was only a youngster, but I noticed that as they come up about where we were, there were quite a number of orange men who broke ranks. They took their orange collarettes off. And where were they going? Well, there was a pub called the Four in Hand, and they were going into the Four in Hand. And they were going to be staying there until the return journey. And then they would have maybe staggered out and put their collarette on and rejoined the ranks and so on. So it's a very mixed organization. Supposedly, everybody has a belief in God, but it's clear that there are those who are certainly not saved. So uh, that's uh, one quote uh, that I can give you. And then uh, I have two books here, uh, Behind Closed Doors, uh, written this one's written, and the other one's written by a man called Paul Malcolmson, who I think will be known to uh, the fellowship here. Uh, uh, I well remember Paul uh, coming to the Breda Centre, which housed eventually Jim McCormick's ministry. And there was Paul sitting on the floor of the library in it, with all these books and stuff spread out on the floor, and he was doing his research for these books and so on. So uh, here is a quote uh, from his book, Behind Closed Doors. This uh, relates to the Royal Arch Purple Order. He says, before being fully accepted as a Royal Arch Purple Man, the candidate must endure an elaborate initiation ceremony. At the commencement of the ceremony, the candidate is required to take a binding oath upon himself, known within secret societies as an obligation. In this oath, he commits himself to the Royal Arch Purple Order, its secrets, mysteries, and members. Uh, he then goes on to give the wording of the oath, which is very similar to what I read out earlier. He goes on to say, the Royal Arch Purple here binds the initiates to conceal the teachings and practices of the order and never reveal it to anyone save fellow Royal Arch Purple Men. Such secrecy is unscriptural and runs contrary to our Lord's plan for the church. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Indeed, the Lord says in Matthew 10, 26 to 27, There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Then the other book that uh, Paul had written uh, is on the subject of the Royal Black Institution, and he wrote this on page 30. The Royal Black Institution and the Royal Arch Purple speak often of the mysteries they possess, which must of necessity be concealed from the broad masses. The black man's journey into the secret world of mysteries is mentioned to him as soon as he enters the Royal Arch Purple chapter, the order he must attain before joining the black. The Grand Black Chapter was formed on the 14th of September, 1846. It is calculated to instruct and inform those who are desirous of obtaining a knowledge of divine truth and sublime mysteries. This admixture of biblical truth and man-made tradition is something for which Protestants normally reject Roman Catholicism. So if you're in the royal black, yeah, you're seeking divine illumination, not only from the Bible, supposedly, but also from the traditions within the particular order. I mentioned that there are a number of female 
Masonic groups, and uh, one of them is called the, the Eastern Star. And uh, it says this about the Eastern Star. The Order of the Eastern Star was founded in 1868. It is open to all female relatives of Masons. A master Mason called the worthy patron must be present at all star meetings. What makes the star unique is its feminine character and its use of a large five-pointed star and five women Bible characters as key rituals. These five heroines of the Bible are Jephthah's daughter, Ruth, Esther, Martha, and Electa. Well, some of those are actually from the Apocrypha, not just the, the scriptures that we regard. The star is regarded by Masonic women as a fine Christian institution within Masonry. For all this piety, the star is actually one of the most blatant examples of satanic gall in all Masonry. The symbol of the star is an inverted five-pointed star known in witchcraft as a pentagram. The inverted pentagram is the official symbol of the two largest satanic churches, the Church of Satan and the Temple of Set. Why does a supposedly Christian organization have the ultimate symbol of the devil as its logo? So there you go now, friends. Not only Freemasonry, there are certainly major, major problems but also within Orangism, I believe there are questions that Orange Man should really consider. In both his letters to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote, give none offense. And he's talking about, as we move about in our everyday life, we are to seek to give offense to none. But if membership of an organization as a Christian gives unnecessary offense to people or impedes or hinders our ability to communicate the truth of the gospel to them, then we really should withdraw from it. We should not be in some supposed organization that has the Bible there, which prohibits us from actually seeking to win people for Christ. And of course, it gives offense to the only true God of the Bible by what is happening, and so we should immediately withdraw from it. I mentioned uh, about my father. Uh, he was in both the Orange and in the Masonic. Uh, and after I was converted in 1984, and particularly after I met uh, Mr. McCormick, uh, my father and I had some interesting conversations. Uh, my father was a very mild-mannered man, and he would sit and he would listen and so on. And I, I thought, I'm not getting anywhere here whatsoever. But I'm pleased to say that through time, my father resigned from both the Masonic Order and the Orange Order. And so uh, I think that perhaps our little exchanges together had something to do with that. Jesus said in John 18 and verse 20, I speak openly to the world, and in secret have I said nothing. If we are Christ's, then we should follow the Master's example and do what he said in Matthew 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And the reality is that only those who are in Christ can refer to God as our Father. Teach us to pray, Lord, our Father. You very rarely hear God spoken of in the Old Testament as Father. But when the incarnate Son arrived and introduced us to the reality of his Holy Father that he prayed to in John 17. And friends, it's a wonderful privilege. And we should let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. I pray the Lord might bless what we have shared here tonight for his glory.